Next up, we have uh, Dr. Joyce Black. She is the Associate Professor uh, at University of Nebraska in the Department of Adult Illness and Health. Uh, she's an expert on uh, wound healing and pressure ulcers. She's going to talk to us about deep tissue injury. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come to warm climate. I just came from London yesterday where I picked up not only a virus in my nose, but a virus in my computer. So <laughs> uh, I've got a lot of work to do today. Hopefully your weather will accommodate me. Deep tissue injury has actually been added as a stage of pressure ulcers back in 2007. And that early work actually stems from this case. This is a woman who went into the hospital, had elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and was left on a bedpan. You can see the ring of the bedpan over on the left. Um, all of that tissue necrose, she ended up having a diverting colostomy and died of sepsis from the ulcer. And so the question came into play of what would this have been called if we didn't call it a stage one? There was no history of any kind of purple pressure ulcers. So I approached the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel in 2002 and said, we have an issue, we have these purple pressure ulcers. And so they sent me off on a literature review, being a bunch of academicians. And here's what I found. Actually, Dr. Paget, 150 years ago, first described a very unique form of pressure ulcers that rapidly deteriorated into a full thickness wound and had a history of being purple. A researcher in 42 in Germany created deep tissue injury in an animal model and called the deterioration of the wound malignant. Then in 75, Dr. Shea, an orthopedist, created what we use today, or had at that time used, as a four-part staging system, stages one through four. But Shea had something called a closed pressure ulcer that never got put into the nomenclature. And then we had a number of wounds that people mistook for cautery burns and surgery, um, other phenomenon, probably rhabdomyolysis belongs in here to some degree as a form of injury. So in 2007, this was the definition of deep tissue injury that was formulated and accepted at NPOAP. And in today is another form of pressure ulcers. They are pressure ulcers that start at the bone muscle interface and initially present as purple or maroon discolored intact skin. They're also including blood blisters in this original definition. Now we went on in the definition to actually describe a very different appearance to these wounds. We, Actually, didn't know not, we did not know a lot about them, but we knew they were extremely painful. We knew they were difficult to detect in darkly pigmented skin because you couldn't see the purple or red hue to them. We knew that the evolutionary steps included some blistering and eventually a very significant eschar that needed surgical revision, not some kind of long-term enzymatic debridement. And the last sentence we wrote was for the attorneys because up till that time, hospitals were being sued for stage one pressure ulcers that rapidly deteriorated, and these were not that. So the attorneys today are totally confused, which is exactly where they need to be on this DTI story. So when you look at the story, this is Dr. Koziak's model. It's an old model, but do I just write on this with my finger? Ah, very cool. I, I'd seen the other guys do it. I didn't know what, what it was. Here's the x-axis of time, uh, zero to 12 hours, and the y-axis is pressure applied to the skin. So 300 is a very important marker because at 300, this curve starts to change. And all of a sudden we go from what I think is intense pressure, probably not typical in a human being on earth. And we come down to a time frame of three hours. And so that have that hang in your head for a minute. People at risk of deep tissue injury have typically been in one place on a fairly hard surface for three hours of time. That's where you come into this story because some of the people that you receive in your EDs, or ERs, whichever you call it, have been down at the scene of an accident or unconscious on the kitchen floor for an un unknown period of time. That's enough time and that's enough pressure to have actually destroyed the muscle. The way we were taught about pressure ulcers is that we were taught they start as a stage one and then they become a two and then they become a three and then they become a four and it all takes quite a while. This flips that hypothesis on its head in that these pressure ulcers actually start, as I said a second ago, at the bone muscle interface 
and are like the tip of an iceberg. The damage you cases of pure ischemic ulcers where if you push on my skin long enough, the skin will die. I don't know how long that takes. That flight yesterday was nine hours from London to Atlanta. I don't have any pressure ulcers. Well, I didn't, I didn't look, but I don't think I do. I, 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 so how long does it take at low continuous amounts of pressure compared to this deep tissue injury story. Uh, what we believe is that the deep tissue injury is very intense pressure, intense enough that the muscle cells are destroyed and the perforators that come through the muscle body to the skin are eventually killed. So it's probably a combination of pressure and ischemia. Here's some of the work that's been done, particularly in um, Europe and a little bit in Japan. Dr. Geffen, uh, in, actually in Israel, uh, examined these deep tissue injury stories and actually has got evidence in his work of cellular deformation and muscle cell rupture uh, due to the pressures applied to the skin. Dr. Umans in Amsterdam said that if you load and unload pressure onto the skin, so the patient's on their back and then on their side for a moment, and then on their back and on their side for a moment, you'll eventually overpower the ability of the body to reperfuse that tissue and they will break down. That's probably the most typical ICU development of pressure ulcers. Dr. Takahashi adds to the story in that pressure creates the wound. The pressure ulcer that we see due to pressure takes on either the shape of the device on the top of the body, so a CPAP mask, or the bony structure underneath, and that creates a perfectly shaped wound in the shape of the bone or the shape of the device. And then when you shear it, you tear the other tissue. So the typical example would be a sacral pressure ulcer that started uh, teardrop shaped or round. And then as the head of the bed is elevated for cranial pressure precautions or ventilator associated pneumonia precautions, the upper edge of that tissue all shears away and you get undermining from nine to three o'clock. And that's the shear piece adding to the story. Dr. Bader said these are not due to moisture and friction. These are a, a deep phenomenon. So then depending on the intensity and the duration of pressure, you get different patterns of deterioration. On the top picture, that's an OR-acquired ulcer. To me, a very classic OR-acquired ulcer because it's not on the sacrum. It's on the tissues of the buttocks. And so these are cases typically in the OR for three hours of time. Pressures can be pretty high on an OR table depending on how good your mattress is. We bought ours with the Hill Burton Act of 67. So ours are running a little old. The middle one, the middle picture, that's a lady who got a DTI from a Ted stocking. She had her heel elevated and the pressure of the stocking was enough to cause DTI of the heel. And the bottom one on the, on the left side is a bariatric patient who'd been in critical care for quite some time, had intact skin until he coded and that is 48 hours later. So that's pure ischemia, I think. Pathophysiologically, to me, these look like or act like the MI, the stroke, those same phenomenon where you have a zone of infarct surrounded by a zone of ischemia and a zone of injury. Those are the zones that I think we can rescue if we treat them aggressively. We know that muscle doesn't tolerate uh, blood flow and we know that at three hours, uh, we can have significant damage, elevations in CPK, uh, as I said, a variant of rhabdomyolysis. We also believe pathophysiologically there's some reperfusion injury going on here. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be illogical to think that. There's been absolutely no work done, though, in the area of reperfusion for deep tissue injury with any antioxidants, any, anything like that that I have read. Epidemiologically, we're seeing a fair number of these. This is some work done by Van Gilder in about 10,000 cases. She said that most of these DTIs either form in the ICUs or in the LTACs, um, and we're starting to see more and more of them because people are choosing to label pressure ulcers as DTI rather than other stages. DTI incidents continuing this idea, as I said, we're seeing more. We're starting to see them identified as on the buttocks, as well as on the sacrum and on the heels. They are more prevalent than the threes and fours, but I actually think they are the beginning of the threes and fours. So to me, it makes more sense that we see them. Here's a typical DTI progression. The picture on the left is the beginning of the story. Actually, the story began 48 hours before that. 48 hours ago is when the pressure was applied to the skin. Initially, it's purple and intact. Then it blisters at about 72 hours and it becomes necrotic at about seven days. So that very rapid deterioration is not at all what you would typically think of a standard stage one to two to three, four pressure ulcer. As part of my work with NPOAP, I looked at 82 cases 
of patients who sued their health care providers for pressure ulcers that were purple at the beginning. And the idea was that 48 hours before the skin turned purple, there had been some period of confinement. And I use that word very specifically to mean this patient could not move off of that surface if they wanted to. So they were anesthetized, sedated, paralyzed, restrained. There was some reason that they were not able to move off this high intensity pressure surface. Maybe the garage floor, maybe the kitchen floor, maybe the backboard, maybe the OR table, maybe the cath lab, doesn't matter. The surface is hard, the patient can't move. Then in another 24 hours, I saw blistering in these cases. The population that I examined had a very wide age range. These are not pressure ulcers in elderly, contractured, malnourished nursing home residents. These are pressure ulcers in yesterday they were fine kind of folks, no past medical history. And they almost, in my cases, they all came in for some urgent issue. Another gal in New York looked at natural history also, 200 cases. She was seeing them once they were admitted. And she saw exactly the same progression of deterioration as far as rate. The 46% were necrotic by day seven. She found anemia. I did not see anemia in my case. Here's a more recent, uh, smaller sample of only 40. What's interesting in this sample is they now saw anticoagulation as a piece. This sample was done in 2010, 2009. And so now anticoagulation is a piece. And the last one I have, uh, oh, I missed one. Uh, this is the one from the Mayo Clinic. Basically the same pattern of deterioration. Fewer are becoming necrotic. We're getting a little more aggressive with the management of them. But we're continuing to see today uh, the use of anticoagulant in that patient history. Diagnosis of DTI tends to be predominantly by history and physical exam. There aren't any diagnostics. There's some beginning work being done on ultrasound. Uh, nothing definitive at this point. And some people draw CPKs. Very difficult to distinguish where that elevation's coming from. A little bit of work being done in thermography. I think it's got some possibilities for us to determine this ischemic tissue. The prevention of DTI is pretty short. Whatever program you're doing now uh, to prevent pressure ulcers will, in and of itself, prevent DTI. And any program that you do to um, decrease the severity of pressure ulcers in your facility will decrease the severity. Sorry about that. The clinical presentation of these things is a bit unique. We were taught that pressure ulcers occur on bony prominences. These do not. These occur on wherever pressure was applied to tissue. So you need to get that out of your headset that if it's not on the sacrum, it can't be a pressure ulcer because these are clearly a different phenomenon. There is a delay in the presentation. There's a 48-hour period of time in which the, the skin looks normal. And there's where the issue comes in for hospitals. The patient is admitted during that 48-hour window, and the initial assessment of the skin shows intact skin. And so now this purple tissue appears. The patient's already admitted, and an external reviewer will come to believe that it happened on your watch, where actually it happened 48 hours before the pressure, 48 hours before the purple skin appeared. And the question is, could you have done anything for the patient at that point in time? not what are you doing now. I like to say the horse is out of the barn by the time that you see purple tissue because the damage was already done some 48 hours ago. The rapid deterioration makes lawyers very interested in this. So that time frame from visible injury going back is, is at least 48 hours. Today I'm seeing a little bit shorter period of time in paraplegics, quadriplegics, a little bit longer period of time in bariatrics, but I don't have enough of a sample yet to pull that up and, and uh, give, it, give you any more data than that. The other piece of our story is figuring out what position the patient was in at the time the injury happened. And this is part of the root cause analysis piece that you're interested in to make sure that your hospital can be paid for these pressure ulcers being labeled as present on admission. So if the ulcer's on the buttocks cheeks itself, the patient was flat at the time that that injury occurred because the buttocks are in contact with the surface. So that's what the OR ulcers are going to look like. The backboard ulcers are going to look like. The prolonged ER stays, if the patient's flat, that's where they're going to look. That's where the ulcer's going to appear. If you see the ulcer on the sacrum, it means the head of the bed was elevated. If you see them on the ischium, it means the patient was sitting fairly erect. Uh, with today's progressive mobility guidelines, we're seeing a lot of folks with ischial and low buttocks ulcers. Bottom of the foot, the patient's probably standing on the footboard or has some kind of boot on the bottom of their leg. 
The other piece that we have seen is when patients are moved from the ER to the cath lab, to the OR, to the ICU, back to the cath lab, back to MRI, it increases the risk of DTI. And I don't know if it's the lateral shearing of moving the patient from one surface to another that's making that data uh, appear clinically. This is a DTI after a 12-hour Whipple procedure. You can see, um, at least I think, there's the original DTI on the buttocks from lying flat on the OR table. This DTI is later on from uh, being head of bed elevated in the ICU, so we need a couple root cause analyses. Here's a very classic DTI, uh, upside down heart shape uh, on the sacrum of a head of bed elevated patient. This patient was septic in the ICU and not turned for a while. Here's DTI in black skin. To me, I think it looks exactly like the one we just saw, uh, an upside down heart shape. Uh, this blistering here is the epidural by the nurses that saw this patient, and of course there was no trauma to account for that. Clinical profile of risk, how do we know these patients before they come in? They've been confined for over three hours. So OR, IR, ER, found down at the scene. I think an important piece for your ERs is to ask EMS or paramedics what position the patient was found down in at the scene and get that recorded in the record because later on if DTI appears on those same positions, the evidence is then pretty powerful that it started before it came into your facility, and the government will allow you to call those present on admission. I don't know the whole story on anemia and anticoagulant use. Um, I, I, I have a feeling it's there, but I can't really pull it up. I think the difficulty is a lot of people are anticoagulated today, so it can take a very big sample to pull that up. Develops on tissue subjected to pressure, so here again, developed while the head of the bed was up, developed while the patient was flat. And you're going to need to know that in order to do a proper root cause analysis and figure out you know, what's going on. Lots of differentials in this story. Traumatic events obviously lead to bruising, but you have a history of trauma. On the top picture, that's a patient who was anticoagulated, fell into the bedside stand. The middle patient, uh, just to orient you, this is the gown of the patient. Here's the hands of the person holding her over. So this is the side of the hip. That is a patient who had a pelvic uh, hematomas from an open book pelvic fracture. The hematomas were large enough that they caused a morel lavalet lesion and all the skin died on the top of those hematomas. She actually sued for the loss of her entire buttocks muscle and it was, it was thought that she was not turned in critical care when in fact it was a morel lavalet lesion and of course a plain old hematoma. You have a history of trauma in those cases. Ischemic events can also lead to purple pressure, purple tissue. Uh, on the top is a patient on high doses of levofed and critical care. Not only were feet purple, nose, ears, toes, everything else was purple. Venous congestion can lead to purple tissue, but it moves. As the patient moves, the venous congestion changes. And I wish I could tell you about end-of-life ulcers. I, uh, I don't know much about them. I think the pathology is different in those. Uh, we're trying to kind of get a national understanding of them, but I, I, I have nothing uh, really to help you with. Fair number of skin diseases have a purple hue to them, Coumadin necrosis, calciphylaxis, uh, lymphedema, and pyoderma can also have a purple look, but to me they have a very different profile. This is the same photos I just showed you. I think I can skip over that in an interest of time. Here's the pictures of OR ulcers. These are both OR patients. These are both coronary bypass patients. Um, and we can see the appearance of the DTI on the buttocks tissue, not the sacrum itself. So determining the onset is very important in a root cause analysis because you want to go back and try to figure out where the patient was 48 hours before the skin turned purple. That will help you get the lawyers off your back, if nothing else. Important in the ER because the history of the patient may include that 48-hour time lag. Now, if your patients are staying in the ER for 48 hours, we might have a different issue, and you need to get those folks in beds and get them off of their backs. Recommended treatment, I wish I had a whole ton of slides to show you. Basically, I can tell you the principle is to remove pressure from the area, so the patient needs to get off of their back, lying side to side, get their heels and boots, upscale their support surfaces, the principle being to maintain perfusion of that ischemic tissue. A little bit of building data on non-contact ultrasound. I don't have real fine studies. I have some pre and post studies, so it's not, not great. The use of Vasolex or topical vasodilators has been talked about, but I have no evidence, and there's no evidence to support early debridement or hyperbaric oxygen. Here's that study of low-frequency ultrasound. It's a cohort group 
a, a group of comparable size was studied with standard of care and then a group with non-contact ultrasound. And they had pretty reasonable outcomes with the non-contact ultrasound. Important to track DTI in your hospitals, important to get that root cause analysis done because it makes it possible to make the claim that this pressure ulcer was actually percolating at the time the patient came in. Once you collect single cases, I would encourage you to start collecting groups of cases and figure out where your risks are coming from, if they're coming out of the OR, if they're coming out of ICU, if they're coming out of long ER stays. So what I think we have in the pressure ulcer story is here's a DTI at the top of this profile, high pressure, low period, or short periods of time, and a very classic stage one, long pressure, long times, lower amounts of pressure. DTIs can be dangerous due to the fact that the muscle's involved straight away. They're very dangerous ulcer. I would encourage you to educate your staff to recognize that high risk profile patient, the one who's been down, the one who's had a th three hour OR stay, a three hour or plus down at the scene stay, uh, and then that purple tissue 48 hours later. Be sure that you offload them once you find them, get them in boots, and uh, talk to the family about the fact that they will be a significant wound. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Byford, for the informative talk.